I'd like to introduce to you um, two really um, exciting speakers that I'm really happy to host here tonight. Let me tell you a little bit about both of them. First of all, directly to my uh, right, your left, is Alan Schoenbaum, who is the co-founder and managing director of Build Group, a, a venture capital firm which invests in fast-growing technology companies, where he's helping entrepreneurs to build and grow technology companies by providing uh, strategic planning, uh, tech, uh, strategy and business model development, operational advice and legal expertise. And I should say he's a JD as well, so I'll be very careful with my legal questions tonight. <laughs> From uh, December 2005 until February 2014, Alan was the Senior Vice President and General Counsel at Rackspace Hosting, Inc., uh, the New York Stock Exchange, RAX, where he oversaw legal, corporate governance, corporate uh, government affairs, merger and acquisitions, compliance and regulatory matters. Alan was a key member of the management team during the hyper growth of Rackspace with his extensive experience in mergers and acquisitions, corporate development and corporate governance. Alan also serves on the board of directors of Group 42 Inc., a holding company for global energy service companies. He holds a bachelor's degree from the University of Texas at Austin and a law degree also from the University of Texas Law School. Welcome, Alan. Thank you. To Alan's right, we have uh, Jim Curry. Jim. Jim has over 15 years of high growth technology leadership experience. Prior to the Build Group, he spent nearly a decade at Rackspace as the Senior Vice President of Strategy and Corporate Development. He focused on the key in initiatives and strategic pivots required to main the maintain the company's long-term growth through development of new businesses organically as well as through acquisitions. This includes managing Rackspace expansion into Asia, its launch into public cloud via acquisition of Slicehost and the development of the private cloud business. In 2010, Jim founded the OpenStack project, which is now recognized as the leading open source cloud infrastructure project and one of the fastest growing open source projects in history. He ran the OpenStack project until its transition to a foundation in 2012, at which point he served on the board. In 2013, he was named a cloud computing pioneer by Information Week with Dungeon. And prior to that, uh, he was at Rackspace. Jim was in a leadership, prior to Rackspace, he was in a leadership role at Dell, Bow Street, and Tivoli, both of whom were acquired by IBM. Jim earned his MBA at Harvard and his undergraduate degree at the University of Texas. So, guys, impressive backgrounds. Thanks for being here. Today. A little too long. We probably should shorten those a little bit. <laughs> but we're, we're alums. We're UT. Yeah. I went to UT undergrad and law. And yeah. Excited to be back here. here. Yeah, excited to be back. That's great. It's great to be here. Thanks for being here. So, if you will, tell us a little bit about your entrepreneurial backgrounds. Uh, there's a little synopsis here, but I think there's probably some nice, real, interesting stories about how you got into these businesses, namely together, Rackspace. Yeah, I'll start. Um, I, coming out of business school, I actually, uh, well, actually, I'll take a step back. I started my career uh, as an investment banker uh, and working in private equity coming out of UT. <clears throat> and one of the things I decided I wanted to do is get more actively involved in management. So after I got out of Harvard, uh, this was in uh, 1999-2000, the dot-com phase, which I'm sure a lot of you guys remember. Joined a company called Bow Street. Um, we raised $130 million in venture capital. I was one of the first 10 guys there. Uh, it was a lot of fun. I learned a lot, but we went belly up uh, like everybody else in 2001. Um, and that process for me was really interesting in that uh, I learned as you're starting a company, you don't actually get a lot of outside help. Um, it actually was relatively easy to raise money then. It was really hard to get outside advisors. And Everything we were doing was not only new as a function to us as a management team, but it was new to us because the industry was new. Not, not, much, not many people knew how to think about it. Now, Jim, you're supposed to be a tech guy. You yeah, can't no. get rid of the microphone. I'm sorry. This is analog, not digital. Software. It's not software. Yeah, yeah. Not media. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Uh, <laughs> note to self, don't shift position. It falls. So, <laughs> um, so you know, uh, that process was a, a real learning experience for me. And when I had a chance to join Rackspace, uh, in 2006, what excited me about the company was not only just the opportunity, but when I met with uh, Lanham, who's our other partner in, and uh, on Build Group, um, I had an opportunity to see that the company was really uh, not only focused on the long term, but was very open to uh, involving others, bringing outside expertise on the team, uh, and I got really excited about the opportunity with that company. And uh, you know, built, uh, Rackspace. I don't know how many people know the Rackspace story, but uh, founded in basically 1999. Uh, went public in 2008, now is about a $2 billion company. 
Um, and that ride was a lot of fun. Um, again, very similar to Bow Street, we had to do it on our own uh, in a lot of ways. But we also had a really good team that was very supportive of each other. We brought in a lot of outside experts to help us. But one of the key learnings coming out of that, which we'll talk more about in a second, is um, we want to help entrepreneurs get the help we hadn't had previously in our careers, which is not just to get the capital and advice at board meetings, but actually to be their partner in thinking about how to build a business. Thank you, Jim. Yeah. Alan. Yeah, we want, we want to be to the companies that we invest in what the VCs that invested us were not to us, really. We want... <laughs> You, good guys. <laughs> no, they're great. They're and, good guys. And they added a lot of value, but they didn't offer the kind of roll up your sleeves approach that we want to bring. So, Alan, give, give, give yeah. us a few more examples about that approach you want to bring. Okay. So, and just kind of by way of my background, I, I, was, uh, I started out my life as uh, running political campaigns when I was in college here and in law school. And then after... 1984 was a kind of a loser. I and had finished law school. I uh, became a corporate lawyer and represented small companies, lots of entrepreneurs. Learned a lot about entrepreneurs and represented some venture funds. And then after 21 years at Aiken Gump, went to Rackspace and then learned what. Because I always wanted like do it for real, right? Yeah. Rather than just give the advice. And boy, that was a lot to chew on. But over, after nine years, I really learned a lot about what it takes to run a business and to grow a business. And Rackspace was in hyper-growth mode. Jim and I were there when it was just going. We were hiring like 100 people a month at, at some. So you think about 100 people a month. You know, some companies that are really successful only have, what, 100, 200 people in it. So we were doing 100 a month. And to put the processes in place okay. and the systems to make all that happen was a great learning experience. Sorry. So, no, I, so you, you, you not only just jumped out of the law business and went into a hyper-growth company, you were actually learning how to scale the business and the process, through the processes and what you needed to do at the same time. That's correct. And actually, over, over those uh, several years, I felt like we really got good at scaling, and Jim and I worked on a lot of projects together to scale the business, and we think we know something about that now. Well, there's an example you should talk about, which is, you know, we were all asked to do things we didn't know how to do. Uh, well, I, you knew how to do it, probably. I didn't know how to do all, all this stuff, but, but I didn't. You, you, were at, you, you ran our HR team for a while. Uh, you ran yeah. recruiting, uh, and that's what you have to do in high-growth companies, is you have to get in and, and take on these roles. Uh, but again, it's, uh, it, it, doing it for the first time without out, a lot of outside help is a challenge. And, and you can be very entrepreneurial in a larger company. Right. Mm -hmm. you know, like so, so Jim, for example, uh, led our team to open the Hong Kong office. So it's just like opening a brand new business. So it was you know, starting from zero, creating a business plan and a budget, and recruiting the people within the company who had to take time off their normal jobs. Because nobody got to just say, well, I'm going to work on that. It was like, we need you to dedicate some period portion of your time to it, and he organized the whole thing, and we opened up a very successful Hong Kong office. Well, you guys don't have gray hair. You're looking pretty good for all of this hyper-worth in, in this hyper-growth that you were, you were involved well, in. Alan, so bike, you must Alan bikes to work every day, so that's I how was, I was going to say, you must thrive on, <laughs> on, on these kind of high-growth companies, and are those yeah. the kind of companies you're looking for today? We are. We, we want to find companies that have founders that welcome our activity. I mean, we, want, we don't want a company that, or we don't want to invest in a company that just wants money, because that's not as much fun. I mean, we're only going to do a handful of investments every year, you know, two, three maybe. And we want entrepreneurs that value our experience so we can kind of roll up our sleeves and help them with their projects. Um, Jim, is there any particular type of company that your build group's looking for? Yeah, I think we're not, uh, we're, we're definitely not focused on seed stage. So uh, I think there's a lot of great firms and options uh, in this town to, to get seed capital. For us, it's really focused on people who have, have gone out, have proven there's a market for their product, uh, have proven out they understand how to scale the business uh, economically, how to build a profitable economic model, but just don't know how to build it into a big company. Um, mm -hmm. They're typically entrepreneurs who uh, want to have a vision for building something big. Uh, and a lot of what we have to help them with is thinking through the organizational scaling challenges. Again, Rackspace, if you want to use it as an example, 
the strategy has been consistent for you know 16 years now. It's been let's be a service provider in an industry where no one else is a service provider. Um, and the, the challenge was in building the company around that to be successful. And the execution is what allowed it to do so well. And I think that's what we're looking for as companies where we have that opportunity to help with that execution. So in helping for the execution, Alan, um, are we talking about you guys spending time as board members and not just as investors, are actively an extension of the management team, mm -hmm. so many hours a week or month? All that. All so so well, we've, just to be clear, we've only invested in two companies so far. But we, as part of the team, we will spend time. So, we, so first, as an example, the first company, Please. Lanham Napier, our partner who was the CEO of Rackspace, serves on the board. And Jim coaches and helps people with product and, and engineering and general business issues. I help with legal and HR and culture issues. And, and Klee Kleber, who I don't know if you all, anyone here knows Klee. Klee is a, we call him a builder. He's part of the team who helps us. He was the CMO at WP Engine, before that Rackspace, and before that Segway, and before that Dell, is helped set up the marketing effort before we hired, before the company hired CMO. So we're spending a lot of time beyond just the board time with the companies, helping them with their projects and business problems. It would, would you say that's worth more than the money you're investing? Or? That's a good question. That's a good question. Um, the, the, I, I think for us, the way we think about it is um, we have the opportunity to help the entrepreneurs generate a much better outcome because we're, putting, we're getting involved with their company. So the idea is that you know, for us in the, the process of creating alpha for our investors, for us, uh, it's really a process of, of getting in there and using our experience to help uh, drive better outcomes quicker. And it's the same thing for the entrepreneurs. If we can help you think through your problems, they can be very basic things. They can be, how do you recruit? How do you think about taking a services business and turn it into a product business? What does an enterprise salesperson do? How do I bring those people on board? How do I think about the right time to expand into a new customer set? A more strategic question. But the more we can help them think through those things and solve that, I think that we help them be, the company be more successful. Is, uh, you, you said that this wasn't at the very earliest stage of, of investing in that there's a lot of companies locally who are very successful in the early investment yep. stage, the seed stage. Would you describe the stage you're investing more of a series A for expansion or a series B for uh, consolidation and perhaps even further acquisition? We debate this. We do. We debate <laughs> it all the time. <laughs> so series A simply means that it's a round of preferred stock. It could happen at any time in a company's history, but people use that as a shorthand for some particular point in a company's life cycle, in which we, we don't subscribe to that notion. So we really think of it more in terms of the, where the company is. And we like to, so, it could, so we would be happy to be the first institutional round and do a series A for a company as long as it's met our criteria. And it could be a series B or even a series C as long as it kind of meets our criteria, which is pretty narrowly typed. Alan, tell us about the criteria. Well, Jim and I are gonna do that together. Okay. It's, so the, 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 the first thing is that the company needs to have product market fit. Yeah, right? so to, yeah, just to think about what that means is, um, you know, one way to think about it, go back to your original question, I, 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 I debate this all the time because everyone asks this question, are you Series A, are you Seed, are you Growth, are you Late Venture? And I really, at this point, I'm, I'm so confused by the terms, I'm not sure I really know how to think about it. It's okay, you have Alan with you, he's your lawyer. <laughs> but this product, market fit, <laughs> this product market fit is the one that I think actually helps to really define it, which yeah. is uh, growth stage guys, so guys like Alan Klein who we're talking about at Vista or others, they typically sit down when there needs to be diligence done around the product and the customers, but really they're looking at uh, traction of the, of the product through the sales of the product or the usage of the product as proof point that they've achieved something special. So for us, the way I think about it is we sit down with a model, we look at the, uh, the company, we don't spend a lot of time trying to figure out is there a market for this, are there customers for this, is it uh, really technologically differentiated? Of course we do on the surface level, but the real thing is we look at the results and then we say, okay, well let's think through what does this look like when you run it at scale, do the unit economics make sense? Is the market size big enough? All those types of things that more of a later stage investor would do. So that's kind of how I think about it. So to, to Alan's point, 
Product market fit is where it all starts. Mm -hmm. do, you, do you have a product that someone likes? And that's not always measured in revenue. If you're an open source company, it's measured in downloads and usage. Um, uh, if you have a different model that's not always tied directly to selling up front, it's just people like what you're doing. And there's a segment that clearly wants you to continue to make the product. And then the second piece of it is, is the revenue piece, which is, are they buying it from you? And what do the economics look like on those purchases? Okay. I like to say that, that the, the most telling thing about a company is what the customers say about it. Mm -hmm. And we want to, to invest in companies that have customers that love them and that are telling their friends about them and that are buying more from them and ha so that the company has a, I mean, we want to see several million in revenue for these companies with a path to strong growth and sustainable uh, growth. Sustainable growth. And is, is there other criteria that you actively look at in, in this early yeah, yeah. process? Yeah, I mean, the next thing I would say is we, we definitely look for uh, companies in very specific spaces. Um, so we're, we don't do consumer investments. Uh, we specifically do software investments, although software these days is uh, probably a little bit more loosely described. But the categories we spend most of our time on are vertical SaaS. So people who built SaaS solutions that are particularly targeted at different types of verticals. Um, and our second investment's in that space. We haven't announced it yet, so I can't really talk about it, but uh, it's in that space. Uh, second one is open source, uh, open source innovation businesses, uh, which is what our, our first investment, which is public, it's continuum analytics is. Um, data analytics, machine learning, AI, uh, which is also what continuum is involved in. Uh, and then marketing tech, so people that are helping to automate the processes of sales and marketing uh, on the revenue generation side. Um, a really nice defined but cohesive set. Some of those investments over time could help some of the other portfolio companies. Yeah? Agreed. Yeah, it, it could. I mean, if, if, as part of an ecosystem. So how do you find these opportunities? Do they find you? You're kind of fairly new as the build group. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you what, we've talked to a lot of companies. But yeah. Our firm has, and we started r really roughly in March and really kind of got started in earnest talking to companies and. April, and the the really the Austin technology community has been amazing, it's so welcoming, and such great people here. It's phenomenal, uh, and as a result, we've had lots of opportunities to talk to people in different places. But we've not limited our our search for the for great companies to Austin. We've actually the second investment that we did is in Toronto, Canada. And but it's because we're trying to find the companies in that in those categories that we we talked about. But we really prefer Austin if we can find something great. Yeah, it's a uh, the, the one thing I'd say uh, sourcing like for any other firm, it's about being disciplined and understand. I think the one thing that I have found uh, really rewarding. First of all, it's it's great to be in a position where you get to talk to so many interesting companies and people. You know, Alan and I spent 10 years uh, focused on the same company and the same industry and uh, the same set of issues, which it's always great to go deep, but man, after you get a chance to kind of decompress and look at other stuff, that, that part's a lot of fun, it's honestly. Fun. But the, uh, the thing that's been most rewarding is when you go in and sit down with other entrepreneurs and they can feel the empathy for you from, them, from you, uh, they can feel confident that you can speak uh, on a wide range of topics on things they're facing, we get really strong reception from entrepreneurs for that. Um, and it's not a marketing scheme for us, it's just who we are. I think you know, what Alan said a minute ago is really important to us. You know, I think we're probably entrepreneurs first and investors second, uh, and we get a lot of joy out of working on the operating side of things and helping companies think through those issues. So that part um, has been helpful for us, and I think it also makes a difference in how we'll do our sourcing going forward. That's great. If anyone has a question, would you please go to the mic um, so we can be ready? But I'm gonna ask another question. During the Rackspace growth, and you use the very skills that you're using to help other companies, you also did a lot of acquisitions. You saw a lot of emerging yeah. companies or growing companies then. We did. Is it any different today with Build Group looking at the deals you're looking to invest in now versus looking at those potential acquisitions? Oh man, that's, what a great question. that's a great question. Um, so I, I would say that uh, obviously buying something to hold as an independent platform, you evaluate differently than something you're gonna plug into a business. Um, you know, when Al, Al and I worked really closely, obviously, on our acquisitions together. All, all of them. All of them. Um, How many were there? Eleven. 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 Um, I think that's right, give or take that's one. Right. Um, you know, I, as I, um, you know, the, the, the one thing that we did that is very similar is 
uh, Rackspace didn't do any sort of roll-ups. So we didn't look to buy revenue in spaces that were adjacent to what we did. We didn't buy other managed hosting companies. Uh, we didn't buy other things that looked similar to us. Instead, we used it as a way to buy platforms that led us into new markets. Um, and that's a little bit of the way we evaluate it now. Um, we were also value investors. Um, we bought a company called Slicehost. I don't know what I can say about what we paid. We paid. We, we paid it's been a, so long ago. The statute of limitations passed on that. We didn't pay. We didn't. <laughs> we paid. A, we paid a fair price for the business, but we took it and uh, it became the basis of what, what is now Rackspace's cloud business, and ultimately it became OpenStack, which is a you know hugely successful effort for for Rackspace. And by the way, one of the smartest people I've ever met was running that company, and he lives in Austin, Texas today. His name is Jason Seats. Yeah, he runs the Techstars effort. If you didn't get a chance to know yes. him, he's a great guy to know. And Jason has now gone on to Techstars Venture Fund. That's, That's right. right. But he was the CEO of Slicehost. Interesting. Yeah. So that leads me to a strange question. So does Rackspace have their own investment mafia? Like... You know, you've now got Jason in the investment business as an acquisition. You've got you guys well, doing we, some acquisition. And I'm giving you an analogy to perhaps the Peter Thiels and the PayPals and the... Yeah, well, we can only wish. You know. Well, we've, we've actually been more successful at launching companies. And I, I actually take a lot of pride in the folks that have come out of Rackspace to have a lot of success. So there's a company called Datastax, uh, which provides Cassandra as a service. And they're a very, very successful company at this point, I think, approaching unicorn status. Um, uh, Tilt uh, is another company that came out of Rackspace, uh, X Rackers. They've been very successful. Uh, another group that just uh, got out of uh, the Y Combinator this summer is a group called Gravitational. Um, you've got Pat Matthews um, and the Webmail guys have been doing stuff. Bill Babel, who's here in town, uh, he runs ping boards and a lot of stuff with the Capital Factory. I think it speaks to our culture. We, we were very good at growing uh, people who really wanted to go out and make a difference. Um, and uh, uh, we also acquired the same type of people. So uh, investing mafia is probably not the right word, but definitely like-minded <laughs> souls. Okay, um, I, will, I will remember And, and I, will vouch, you, I will vouch every single one of them uh, is, uh, passes the no a-hole rule, which okay. to me is, is important. They're all really good people. And, and uh, you, know, we, uh, you know, the culture part of it is really important to us. That, that, that's absolutely clear. The and, culture was really important to us at Rackspace, and it will be at any company we invest in. Tell us a little bit more about that, Alan. I know you, s you both spent time on the culture, but you specifically yeah. mentioned that earlier on. It's really, culture is the first thing one should look for when, whenever they apply for a job or think about taking a job. What is it like? What would it be like to work there? What are the people like? What are their values? So Rackspace was a values-driven organization, and people were very serious about it. And there were certain things about the company that, that you bought into or you, you just didn't enjoy working there and, and wouldn't last. And so and so culture is to me something that it can it can change over time, it can evolve, but it has to kind of start with the foundation that the founders create. And it has to reflect their values. It can't be something that's forced or or artificial. But it has to be something that is authentic and also demonstrates their, their high integrity. And, you know, it's like the Zenefits deal. I don't know if you all saw that the other day where the CEO or the founder was cutting corners from a compliance standpoint in a very highly regulated industry and something had to change. And, the, and he was ousted because that was probably not a great culture. Great culture, I think, really starts with ethics. It also has to define what you, you know, what you really stand for. We, we were a customer support company. I think you know, we're thought of as a tech company, but in the end, we provided customer support uh, for a very important function, which is to keep their web servers running that provided all the revenue to their business. And everything we did was around making sure there was a great customer support experience. So everyone got screened for customer service. It didn't matter what your job was. If you're in the accounting department, you had to be believe in good customer service. Um, everything we did in terms of how we thought about our expansion was about expanding customer service. And the thing that uh, uh, is an example of how this really manifests itself when you get in a line to a company like that, uh, we had a, a process where we basically had a major data center outage. I'll never forget, it was on a, I think it was on a Sunday afternoon. And um, uh, I was in Austin and drove into the office. And I think without anyone being summoned to the office, the entire office was filled with people who just came in, went to their desk, started dealing with customers and, and solving that issue. And that's because we planned for it. And um, you know, ethics are important. 
Um, the values of the firm are important. The mission of the firm is important. It's not stuff that can just be written down. It really does emanate from the founders, uh, and it's really important, I think, for the long-term success of a company. We, we had a core value call that is, I'm sure they still have it, treat Rackers like friends and family. And the, the notion there is not that you, know, you coddle the employee, but, so Rackers were the employees, the, uh, not to coddle them, but to treat them with respect and just like a family member, you know, family members screwing up, you, you know, you tough love or whatever, but to, but to really be mindful of, of the people you work with and with, with respect. Herb Kelleher, who this place is named after, right, this mm -hmm. organization, he, he uh, uh, actually, I'm from San Antonio, and Herb Kelleher was a lawyer in San Antonio and friends with my dad, and I've known him a really long time. And when he was at Southwest Airlines, he told Graham Weston and Lanham and myself that Southwest Airlines treats employees like customers. That was their mantra. So it's kind of a similar thing, right? You want the, you want the employees to feel highly valued. And if they feel highly valued, then when they deal with the actual customer, the customer will feel valued. You know it. So if you talk to someone on a, on a, uh, either a, be call careful center. who you disparage. Pardon? Be careful who you disparage. Okay. Call if you're <laughs> to call if you call some if you're like on the phone with someone at a call center, or if you're in a restaurant, you know if that person is trying to serve you well and and care about you. And if they don't, you're going to feel it, and you're not going to like it. And you're not going to have a good experience. So, so when with respect to culture, you want to hire people, and train people, and honor people, so that when they talk to the customer customer feels really good about it. And this is the same attitude you take into your investments. Totally, so absolutely. So that, that, that is just an extension of your values. Yeah, I, yes. I, hate to, I hate to, we're going to beat this one probably a little bit more than we should, but <laughs> Continuum Analytics is just another great example of it. These guys were, uh, anyone here work for Continuum by any chance? No? Okay. They're, they're, they're at work. Oh, they're at work, good. <laughs> uh, and these guys are there because they love it. So I mean, these guys, the founders are literally scientists, PhDs who uh, needed to have better tools for doing data analysis. They were not developers. They learned Python because it was the easiest to learn. And they ended up writing what became uh, some very well used libraries in Python called NumPy, DataPy, SciPy. And then they launched a business about it. But their whole mission was we really want to make it easier for the scientific community initially um, to discover things that will change the world. Because that's what they were trying to do. They were physicists and biologists. They wanted to do great things. And if you go over there, that emanates in the culture. They are there about doing things that are good for, the, for humanity. Um, a lot of it's obviously now more in the commercial realm, but even then, it's uh, people who want to discover great things. And that, that, to me, attracts a whole great set of employees, keeps everyone very aligned on what they're trying to do, uh, and keeps the uh, organization's mission um, clear. But what's hard is when you look at these situations where it's just muddied, or people think you solve these things with options. That's what it's really about. It's not the issue. It really is, why do you exist? What are you trying to accomplish? And how do you keep employees engaged on that? That's fabulous. Again, uh, if you have any questions, would you just head to the microphone? Sir. Expand the focus a bit you know, on culture in a somewhat different sense. Uh, Austin is full of very creative people in the business realm and full of very creative people in the cultural realm, in opera, ballet, pop music, and all the other things. And at least in the sort of higher cultural organizations like the opera, the ballet, symphony, et cetera, there's a general feeling that maybe because most of the people who've done really well are kind of first generation uh, business people, there isn't the same uh, recognition of the significance and value of the arts to culture more broadly and to the desirability of living in Austin or wherever you live, et cetera. And I wonder whether you have any thoughts about the importance of the arts in that sense and whether there are things that you from your with your capabilities could bring to these arts organizations so that they might flourish here. You want to take that one? You want me to take it? <laughs> the t I mean, I, I would say, you know, I'm not, I'm definitely not an expert on how to think about <coughs> the community development perspective. Uh, 
You know, I think a lot of the, the issues are probably more related to the fact that it's, I, I can't speak to first generation or second generation, but more that's probably, it's a very young demographic here. Uh, and probably a lot of the younger demographic doesn't think as much about getting involved in the arts unless they were directly involved um, earlier in their career. Um, you know, I, I do think that it's something that this community will continue to evolve in. Um, but I, w I would blame it more on age than I would on, on their backgrounds. I don't know. I, yeah, I think some of the more accomplished uh, venture capitalists and executives have actually done a pretty decent job of, of helping with the arts, like John Thornton with the yeah. ballet and, and sponsorship of, of ACL, which is it's commercial true, but it's also important to the arts, South by Southwest. Of course, the tech community is hugely involved in that, and that's, that's not only interactive, but obviously the music piece is, is, is big. But I think you've got a good point. And I think that that's something that successful people that support their community do, and that's helped out with the art. So I think that's something that we should look to. Thank you. Thank you for that. Good evening. Hi. Hi. Uh, I was curious. So when you all have um, a disagreement on which direction your company or an investment should go, like with partners, how do you work through that conflict um, so that the company, you know, moves forward instead of kind of diverging? I, I buy Alan lunch so that he votes with me. Yeah. <laughs> we, is is we, that all it takes? <laughs> Alan is just lunch? I, no, I heard no, you. I'm, I'm, so that's a very good <laughs> question. Great question. Great question. And I like the fact that you use the word conflict. Because we've been, we've learned over the years that we need to mine for conflict and get the conflict out on the table. And we learned this at Rackspace. And the, I don't know if most of y'all have heard of Len, uh, Pat Lencioni. Has anyone heard of him, Lencioni? Five Dysfunctions of a Team. So he's yeah. got a good series of books that actually focuses on this issue. And I think it's, they're quick reads. And they're really good in terms of how to interact with one's colleagues and, and teammates, especially for a group like ours where we're having to figure out, okay, what do we invest in, what do we not, where we really have to, to dig in. So we spend a lot of time together, we talk it through, and we debate. Yeah, we, uh, you know, uh, dynamics are different for teams, uh, uh, probably a lot depend on how well they know each other. When we work together, we have a fourth partner who just joined our team uh, back in September. But other than that, the, the three of us have worked together a really long time. I actually get more concerned. I get less concerned about the mining uh, for conflict because we're actually, we probably over-rotate there sometimes. <laughs> um, but it, it's actually probably more that we just, we take uh, for granted um, how we think the other person's thinking because we know each other so well. But, um, but it, it's actually, if you think about our job, um, the amount of stuff that we have to evaluate and look at, you really have to get really good at, um, at uh, having people take different roles during these debates. Uh, and making sure you're really having it out on both the, the opportunities and, and the real risks on it. And look, as a new firm, I still think we're figuring all that yeah. stuff out. Um, but uh, we, we feel we've done a good job of that so far. So if I may ask before the next question, given there's three of you that have worked together for a long period of time and a, forgive me, a newbie on the team, yeah. wow. how does that work? Pretty well. He's yeah. no shrinking violet, that's yeah. for sure. Uh, <laughs> okay. Okay. So just, he's adopted the same philosophies, the same culture. Yeah. He's got a uh, he's got a different background that I think complements us very well. Um, he has uh, you know 20 years in private equity and venture capital from for really good firms, um, and so I think he brings um, you know and obviously he's worked with a lot of companies, so has a good views on operations as well. And one of the reasons I think he he chose to join us and we wanted to have him on the team is he does fit very well into that environment. Um, and he's very good at um, helping to represent a different uh, point of view at the table a lot of times. It's good to know. Thank you. So. Hello, uh, Jim and Alan. My name is Andy, and uh, I'm a second-year finance major. Um, I was wondering, what are your thoughts on sharing platforms such as Uber and Airbnb, and uh, you know how sustainable you think they are, and will your company ever invest in apps like these? You start. I don't. I mean, <coughs> those are unbelievable platforms. I mean, some of the most successful businesses in the history of the modern world, really, and in Uber. I think the sky's the limit on Airbnb has, has done well. They've had their issues. Would we invest in them? I mean, obviously, if we knew, you know, if we were able to invest in Uber right when it started, knowing what we know now, yeah. But would we, but would we have? Probably not. 
Probably not because it's consumer facing and we're more B2B oriented. Okay. Thank you. Sir. Hello, Jim and Alan. Uh, Alan, you mentioned about the super growth stage of uh, Rackspace uh, when you had 100 people in a month. So uh, my question is, um, so Rackspace has been based in San Antonio, which is not as tech focused as Bay Area or Austin, in that sense. So how do you go about solving the problem of finding the right talent uh, you know, in such short period of time? And also, for you, do you think uh, location does matter, especially for tech companies? Uh, you know, is, is that a priority, or is that really important when you consider investing? Well, uh, location does matter. Geography does matter. Although there are many exceptions scattered throughout the United States and the, what we call the flyover states, so non-Silicon Valley, kind of non-New York, Boston, where tech companies have done well. But the concentration of technology executives, developers, and whatnot in Silicon Valley is extremely powerful and never to be underestimated. I mean, they, they really are the masters of the universe out there. So how, did, how, did, how does a company make it in San Antonio? How does a company make it in Austin? Well, Austin is a whole lot easier, right? Because there's a great technology ecosystem. In San Antonio, for a company like Rackspace, it was a specific set of recruiting challenges that we solved through creating a rather large, uh, highly incentivized recruiting team. And we had specific things that we went after uh, to find the right people. And we also had a pretty good training program for kind of the lower level technology uh, support people where they didn't have to have kind of the CS backgrounds or whatnot. We would train people. So it was a really kind of a, a, a mix of, of recruiting. And by the way, recruiting a lot outside of San Antonio, bringing people through you know, good, good reload benefits and whatnot. So it was, a, it was just a concerted effort to get it done, especially in those numbers. Mm -hmm. Those numbers are tough. Okay. 100 a month, not just one month, it was every month yeah. 100 people yeah. Yeah, until we, we had, got to scale. We had one advantage, though, in that we didn't have to necessarily hire people that had a lot of tech experience. So you know, we were obviously providing a high level technical support, but they're organized in teams. So you would have level one, level two, level three tech, network techs, whatever. You'd bring on people that had maybe limited knowledge of technology, put them on a team, and they'd get on-the-job training. And the, the other thing that uh, uh, Alan mentioned is the training program we had, which he ran for a while too, by the way, was amazing. Um, we were just really good at bringing people on board. And then because we were in San Antonio, once these people were on board and trained and, and really enjoying what they did, they were less incentive to leave. It became sort of a, an advantage for us on the retention side. Um, so we were in a position where we saw an opportunity based in San Antonio, and to try to do that in the Valley would have been a lot harder. Um, would have been a lot harder to find those kinds of people, certainly at the, uh, uh, and make our business model work as well. Um, but Austin has its own challenges. I, I think you know, the, the biggest one that worries me in Austin these days is we, um, we, we actually have a good number of experienced executives, um, but we don't have enough of them the way the Valley does. Uh, the Valley just has... Um, you know, lots and lots of people who've had successful companies. And I'm not talking about exits necessarily. I'm talking about people who've gone out and built teams. So if you were to go ask folks in town now, they're trying to hire a sales leader who's built a 30-person team or customer support person who's built a 50-person team or uh, someone who's built a 100-person engineering organization, it's harder and harder to find in this community. Um, and so I think we need to work on that for the long term for the health of regions like this. But Austin's way ahead of most other communities, mm -hmm. at least. So you guys have been around the Austin tech scene since the beginning, and in the past five years, we've seen a lot of change in the community with an explosion of startups starting here and exiting as well. What do you see happening in the next five years? I'm, I mean, I think the, the launch of the medical school will be great. Um, I think that will uh, put another whole other gear on Austin. Um, you know, combine that with all the technology and startup uh, efforts in this town, I think a lot of great things will happen there. Uh, we're not investing in med tech, maybe we should, but I, I do think that's going to make a big difference. Um, I do think we have a, a real crop of companies that have been building over the last uh, five to ten years in this town. Um, they're starting to re reach more critical scale, and I'm not trying to encourage people to leave those companies, but as they start to leave because there's exits or what have you, I think that'll spur another uh, crop of folks uh, as well. So I see nothing but positive trends in this town. Um, you know, I think it's going to be continue to be um, a great place to be, and it's also starting to get little niches that's known for, um, you know, open source uh, software development is becoming a really well-known thing in this town. 
uh, 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 there's guys that run, uh, for example, the Ubuntu project for Canonical are based here. This year we have the OpenStack conference here in town. We have the uh, OSCON open source conference here. So little things like that are starting to make the, the community better known uh, in, in very specific areas. And I think the more we can do that, the better as well. I think one thing, <coughs> what I'd like to add to that, and I talk about a lot, is that, that Austin's startup community is really, really great. But we also have all the major FANG type companies here that are, mm -hmm. that are at, they're hiring a lot of people. They're training people. They're providing nice livings for people. And those are really ripe places for people to, to learn their craft and then go out and do a startup right. or be recruited Great. from. So having Apple, Facebook, Google. Uh, Dropbox, Box. Dropbox. Yeah. It's, it's a wonderful thing. It's an amazing uh, thing to observe the number of offices of unicorns mm -hmm. in Austin, even though we haven't yet really grown our own unicorns. Right. And yeah. perhaps for the audience, uh, the definition of unicorn is a, an investment in a private company that has a value of a billion dollars while it's still private, not public. And you so. need to just make sure that it's not a donkey with a party hat. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think the donkeys are coming out somehow on the way, but they're all on the West Coast so far, it's okay. <laughs> Sir. Yeah, uh, you've brought up open source a couple times and said you guys are investing in them. Um, you probably saw the InfoWorld articles that kind of came out back to back earlier this week. Uh, the one was written by a guy who was an open source zealot and said, uh, you know, these couple of VCs, if you're not a VC who gets it, you shouldn't invest in it. And talked about how the guy who was at uh, Microsoft, um, you know, not Microsoft, I guess it was Intel Capital, yep. and the other guy who did MySQL, and yep. they got it wrong. They didn't understand Red Hat's business model, et cetera. But then right the next day, you know, another guy came out and said, hey, let's face it, he's right technically on that interview, but there's no money to be made in open source. Yep. And Red Hat was the one example. Nobody's repeated it. And Red Hat, frankly, was a proprietary software company for 10 years before that, and they trademarked it, blah, blah, blah. Right. And then they just, you know, beat everybody out of the market. Yep. So I'm interested in your guys' take. Are you guys one of those VCs that's going to do it? And do you think there's money to be made there? I think the open source model is definitely one that still has a lot of internet for it. But the chances there'll ever be another Red Hat again, I think, are, are fairly small. I mean, that, that model was set up sort of at the end of the client server era. Um, I think it's, uh, it was a different world then. But if you look at the, the stuff that's happening now, a lot of people are doing a great job monetizing open source um, as a service. So again, the example I gave earlier, DataStax does Cassandra as a service. Um, you know, those guys, I, I don't know what's, uh, how to think about their revenue. I know it's good. I know they're doing really well. Um, Cloudera, uh, and the guys are doing work around Hadoop, have, have shown a, uh, They've done well, but no one has built. I, I would think about it a little bit different than valuation. The question is going to be when you get your first billion dollar revenue company, um, and when is that going to happen in open source? And I don't think there's a model that's going to get us there yet. But um, open source itself, there's a lot of different experimentation that's going on around it these days um, in terms of the business model. And I think it's going to be an exciting space to be for sure. Thank you. Madam. Hi, um, thanks for coming out today. I was uh, wanting to find out what quantity of companies that you're anticipating investing in and over what period, like say over the next six months or how, how far out and what quantity, like on a monthly basis or whatever that may look like. T typically probably two to three in a 12 month period. Um, I think the way, because of our model, we want to be heavily involved with the companies as we're um, helping to bring them on board and, and provide them support. Um, and I think for us to be able to do that, we need to have a good, you know, we have to have a limited number of companies we spend our time on. So, and, and also I think, you know, just from a, a, a capacity standpoint for us as a team, you know, having your head and, you know, more than uh, that, a, it's, it's difficult to do. So I, I would say that, you know, in a busy year, we'll do three, maybe at a stretch four, uh, and on uh, average years, it'll be somewhere between two and three, be my guess. Thank you. So let's go back to the investment side. At this point, you guys are, uh, collectively putting your, your own money into these investments, and that's uh, the first round in. How do you see uh, coming along with subsequent investments into your portfolios? Will you be rounding up the VCs? Will you be helping in some way? Yeah, I mean, the first investment we did is publicly <coughs> available information. We were co we co-invested with, with General Catalyst Partners, mm -hmm. and so that was a $24 million uh, investment between uh, our firm and GC. So they're, they're obviously much bigger than we are. So those kinds of co-invest deals will really give companies enough firepower to, to do follow-on rounds. 
But do you anticipate most of the companies that you would put investments in, that you would have perhaps more than one round, given the kind of growth you're trying to achieve? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, ideally we get into a model where you don't need to put a lot yeah. additional capital in. Um, you know, I don't think we see this as being, you know, an A through N series of rounds. Um, you know, a big focus on understanding the economic model is to make sure we understand exactly what, what a reasonable expectation is going to be on a fundraise again, um, and how do we do it at a, at a point at which the company's worth a lot more. Yeah. You know, one, one of the things that was important about Rackspace um, that I, I don't think enough uh, entrepreneurs focus on is uh, we went public <coughs> in 2008, 8808, which uh, we were the last company to go public before the world ended. Um, yeah, we, which was a really fun, it was a fun period of time, but we were about 600 million in revenue and we raised about 30 million in capital. And what was amazing about that uh, was we're in a very capital intensive business. We put up data centers, we put up servers and storage and all that for, for customers, but we'd figured out how to do it in a very uh, uh, economically durable way. And, Using um, leverage. You, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how much detail we want to go into the whole model. But we had a good, we had a really good, um, we had a really good system in place for doing that. And as a result, when we made, went public, uh, obviously the founders did very well, but so did a lot of the employees. And I do think part of uh, being in control of your cu culture and of your company and of your mission is being able to protect that ownership for the founders and the entrepreneurs as well. So you know, we sit down and talk to entrepreneurs about it. I do like them having the mindset of, I like having you as partners. I want you guys in, but man, this is my company. I'm building it. Um, I want to make sure this thing's successful. I want to have the equity reserved to bring on more people that share my vision and want to build something great. Uh, and so we do care a lot about that, not just from an investment perspective, but from the, the company's perspective as well. Do we want to go for the long haul? Okay. So whatever the long haul is, yeah. you're going to be there to, make, to, to help the entrepreneur and the team make it happen. That's the plan. Right. There's very few companies that are successful overnight. Um, you know, I think so many people are used to these stories about the quick exits. And I think, you know, Rackspace was a long build story. It, it was a long 16 years to get there. And I think most companies will operate on a similar profile. I, I totally agree with you, Jim. I think it's a myth in the paper that you have three to five year exits. Right. And the statistics yeah. tell you otherwise. That's right. right. Yeah, I told you. Uh, but having partners for that long period of time is a very serious endeavor, just as you had partners in Rackspace early on. Um, I believe it was Angel funded initially for the f some of that $30 million or perhaps it, all of it. It was. <coughs> yeah. For the first, probably, what, $2 million. And then uh, Sequoia and Norwest came in with some significant capital. That's right. Um, let's finish uh, on this question, if we may. Um, you're early in the funding process. You're very experienced in the team. Dynamics, the growth, the acceleration of businesses, the culture, all the other things. Is there any other areas that you would like to enhance your activities in? You have, of course, the two key aspects, um, team, processes, mm -hmm. money. Does Bill Group like to, is there anything else you think could improve where you're going? Um, I'll say one thing about the long term for us. I mean, we were very purposeful when we set this uh, up, when we set Bill Grip up, that it's a, uh, it's a firm first. Uh, it's actually not, uh, and legally it's a partnership, I guess, uh, the way to think about it. But we thought about it as we're launching another company. And this company has a very specific role to help growth-minded entrepreneurs be successful. And uh, we really want to do that in markets like Austin and other flyover states. Um, and we want it to be in a position where uh, if any one of us leaves, or if all of us leave at some point in the future, it won't matter. The company will, will survive on its own. Um, and I do think that um, as we thought a lot about, <clears throat> at least as I thought a lot about getting into venture capital, uh, a lot of the politics uh, that go on with firms ultimately lead to their long-term destruction. And um, we really wanted to build something that was uh, an institution first. Uh, and that could uh, do a lot of good for companies for a long time to come. So that was our mission with this um, and why we don't call it uh, Napier, Schoenbaum, Curry Capital or anything along those lines. To us, it's important we build a brand that is meaningful to entrepreneurs and folks we work with. Uh, the only thing I would add to that, and that's, that was really great, is that we love to see people get hired at great jobs. And if, if we can help even you know, if, even if it's just like one person, but we want to see lots of people at our the companies we invest in get hired and have great jobs for their families, so they can raise their families, send them to college, have homes, and contribute to the community and the arts and whatever they like to do. Well, 
that's a very fitting ending, and I'd like to end with something that you actually said to us. I'd like the audience to join me in uh, thanking Jim and Alan, the like-minded souls of Bill Group. Thank you.